And our verse this morning is from the book of 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. And this is actually printed in your blue Bibles in the pews on page 989. And also it'll be projected overhead. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians and God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Jeff, for reading for us. I'd like to tell you three stories about how hard it can be to keep going sometimes. Uh, Maybe 10 years ago or so, the Trib did a story about a struggling South Side neighborhood. It was the kind of place with with poverty and gangs and and constant chaos as people were, were in and out all the time and bouncing from one place to the next. And in those kinds of neighborhoods, there's often a lot of broken glass on the ground, uh, in the alleys, on the sidewalks. There's there's not enough stability there to keep that kind of thing in check. Uh, But in this story, there there was one man who was different. He lived there for years, maybe his entire life, and, and he was the only source of real stability on the block. And what he would do is, all by himself, he would sweep up the broken glass on the street. Day after day, year after year, he wouldn't tolerate the, the broken glass, so he, he'd always go out there with his, his broom and dustpan, and he kept doing it. But one day, something snapped. It was too much for him. The, the, the futility of, of doing the same thing and never seeming to make a difference beat down on him, and he couldn't do it anymore. So he threw down his broom and dustpan and walked away in disgust. The people on the street, they saw it happen, and they they remember what he had done for so many years. So they all came out with their brooms and and started sweeping for him. So the story turned out well in the end, but but for that man, it it was just too hard on him. He he couldn't keep going. Another story, I have a, a pastor friend who's really struggling in his church. He's been struggling for years. He's lots of battles that he's fought and lost. His predecessor had been there for something like like 50 years. And the old guard who loved that pastor never really accepted him. And and each year he he preaches to a smaller and smaller congregation. And he's not sure if he can keep going. Last story. Uh, I met a family a few months ago whose adult son has severe developmental disabilities. Uh, and now they're trying to figure out a place for him to stay full time because he's, he's aging out of the specialist center where he is now. And he's too difficult for them to take care of him at home. And, and, and they talked about how they envisioned their lives when they first got married and, and what their lives became after their son was born. And how it was so hard, they felt like they couldn't keep going, even though they had no choice but to keep going. So sometimes it's just so hard to keep going. And, and today we're, we're starting this new series in, in, in a letter that was written to people who are really struggling. Uh, we're calling this series in Second Thessalonians, A Growing and Afflicted Church. At the same time, it's growing and it's afflicted. It's being beaten down. And in today's passage, the encouragement to these suffering people is to keep going. You're, you're, you're afflicted, you're beaten down, but keep going. And the reason you can keep going is because of who you are, your identity in God. Who you are and who you're becoming and what you're facing, all those things are woven together here. So keep going because of who you are. Let's pray together as God's help to receive what he's saying to us. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we, you, you know our weaknesses, you know how the pressures and temptations and afflictions and difficulties we face can overwhelm us, they can bury us, and yet, Lord, you call us to keep going, and you, you give us grace and mercy, you strengthen us in our weaknesses, so use your word, we pray, to encourage us in our afflictions and difficulties. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So keep going because of who you are. So who are you? That's a question of identity. Who are you? 
and that's not just a, a lighthearted, you know, what's your Enneagram number kind of question. Um, I haven't taken the Enneagram test, but some of my colleagues find it a source of amusement to speculate on what my number is. So I, I don't know what else they're saying about me behind my back, but I guess I'm, I'm flattered that my personality is a, is a topic of conversation when I'm not around. And you probably had those conversations too. You know, like, you know I'm a nine, I, I'm a, a four with a seven wing or however it goes. Uh, the Onion had an article a few years ago about the Myers-Briggs test. It was called, I'm an ENTJ destroyer of worlds. <laughs> and we all know those people, don't we, the ENTJs. But, but we're, we're really interested in our identity, who we are. We have, we have all these tests that tell us who we are. There's Enneagram, Myers-Briggs, DISC, Strengths Finder, so many more. And it's all very insightful and, and interesting, but I wonder if it was actually something that, you're, that you struggle with. Who am I? What am I, what, what am I here for? A couple years ago, the New York Times Magazine did a, a piece on popular music because we, what we sing about and what we listen to reflects what's important to us and what we worry about. And the article said, identity is the topic at the absolute center of our conversations about music. For better or worse, it's all identity now. So what's your identity? Who are you? Well, the Apostle Paul has something to say about the identity of the people he's writing to. And that identity is a source of encouragement and strength to them to keep going through some very hard things they're facing. But look what he says, verse 1 again. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians and God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy are the authors of this letter, or although we assume Paul is the dominant voice here. Uh, Silvanus is also known as Silas, and Silas and Timothy were Paul's companions and partners. They're, they're understudies, if you can think of them that way. And you should know the, a bit of the background to how this church in Thessalonica got started. The book of Acts says that Paul and Silas and Timothy were, were traveling in Macedonia. They were going from place to place, and they came to Thessalonica. It's, it's the main city in the region. Uh, it, it was a free city in the Roman Empire. It was a prosperous city. It was, they, were, they were very loyal to Rome, so Rome let them manage their own affairs. So they, so they had all the benefits of being in the empire, but, but none of the disadvantages. So Paul gets to Thessalonica, and he starts preaching to the Jews in the synagogue, as, as he always did, and that was his strategy. But in this city, he didn't have much success with the Jews there, but he did have some success with the Greeks. So he plants this mainly Greek church in Thessalonica, and just as soon as the church gets started, the Jews in the city go after Paul, and they start a riot. And Paul and his friends have to escape the city at night because of the threat of violence. So, in other words, this is about as fragile of a church plant as you can imagine. It's not big. All the members are brand new converts who had grown up as polytheist pagans. They don't have a trained leader in the church, and a violent mob almost killed them. Now, I've read books on church planting, church planting manuals, and they usually don't advocate this kind of model. It's usually, you know, raise lots of money, get lots of people, instead of almost get yourself killed. So it's a very fragile church plan, and this is the second letter that Paul's written to them, that to see how they're doing, to, to encourage them, even though he can't be with them. And look what he says about their identity. Three things. First, they're a church. Their identity starts with being a church. This isn't one person Paul's writing to. It's, it's a church. It's, it's a family. And that's important because what he says about their identity, he's saying about their identity as a whole church. We think of identity in individ, individualistic terms. You know, I, I, I'm a number one. You're a number seven. But for Paul, it's, it's who they are together. That's the key point. They're a church. Second, they're a church which is in God our Father and the, our Lord Jesus Christ. The word in is very important for Paul. Who they are is who they are in God. Uh, the, the scholar Jean Green says that this church, what, what this means is that it, it, it finds its unique identity in its union or relationship with God our Father and the exalted Lord Jesus Christ. So, so who are these people? They're people who know God as their father. 
They're people who know Jesus as their Lord. They're in their Father. They're in their Lord. That's who they are. That's their identity. The technology writer Derek Thomas says that very often we define our identity based on what we do. So, so forget Enneagram numbers. You know, who I am is what I do. He says, I am devoted to my job. I, I feel most myself when I am fulfilled by my work. My sense of identity is so bound up in my job, my sense of accomplishment, and my feeling of productivity that bouts of writer's block can send me into an, an existential funk that can spill over into every part of my life. Parents struggle with this. The, the, the reason I'm so mad at this little person right now is because, their, um, is because their behavior or their failure is a condemnation of my identity as a good parent. That's what we do. What, who I am is what I do. But for this church, it's not what they do that identifies them. It's not their role. It's not what they're useful for or good at. It's who they belong to. They belong to God as their father. And notice Paul says, our father. In, in 1 Thessalonians, his first letter, it starts the same as this one, word for word. But there it says, God the father. Now it's God our father. In other words, God is not just the father in a theological, creedal sense. He's father in a real sense. Now, I know for some people, because of the failures of your father, this, this doesn't resonate with you that much. But what this means is that, is that God is the one who knew you before you knew yourself. He's the one who is committed, to, who is for you and committed to you more than anyone else is. He's your father. And this church is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord means master. He's the one who rules me. So think about that identity. Who you are, Paul tells this church, is children of your father who are ruled by Jesus Christ. Who I am is not what I do. Who I am is not what function I perform. Who I am is who I belong to and who I am ruled by. And here's what this means. Here's the benefit from that identity. Verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so what does it matter that your identity is in your Father and in your Lord? It matters because that's where grace and peace come from. It, Paul often starts his letters like this, you know, grace and peace. And it, it can sound kind of like, a, you know, what's up? How are you? Uh, Robin Cho told me recently that among older generations of Koreans, there's a common greeting that literally says, have you eaten rice or did you eat rice, something like that. Uh, but but what, it, what, it, what it means is more like, uh, how's it going? It, it's, it, it's a greeting that is not intended to elicit a, a full answer to a literal question. But when Paul says grace and peace, it, it's more than that kind of pleasantry. It's, it's more than a formality. Grace and peace are exactly what this hanging on by its fingernails church plants, plant needs to hear. They, they need grace and peace. And they get grace and peace from their Father and their Lord. Uh, look down with me just for a moment to, to chapter 2, verse 16. It says there, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ and God our Father, who loved us and gave, gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. Gives us grace. Now skip down to almost to the, to the end, to chapter 3, verse 16. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. Grace and peace are not just pleasantries. They are the very real and necessary benefits for desperately struggling people whose identity is in God their Father and in their Lord Jesus Christ. So who are you? Who are you really? Are you part of something bigger than yourself? A church, a family of people who are all children of the same Father. And do you know that God is your Father? Do you know that Jesus, who died for you, is also your master who rules you so that you can flourish in him, even when you suffer? Do you know that you live in him? That's who you are. So because that's who you are, keep going. Because of your identity in your Father and in your Lord, keep going. Keep going, first of all, in your growth. Uh, look with me back at our, at our passage in verse 3. 
We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for another is increasing. In other words, Paul's giving thanks. He, he's, he feels compelled to give thanks for this church. Why? Because they're progressing. They're growing. They're an afflicted church, but they're also a, a growing church. They're just not growing in the ways that we usually think about church growth. I'm like most pastors. I'm, I'm very interested in, in quantifiable data points. You know, how does our attendance this quarter compare to the same quarter over the previous three years? And, and how does the, uh, the, the, the trailing 12 months giving compare to previous, the previous year's tra- trailing 12 months giving? Um, the, the, the kinds of things that you can put on a, a spreadsheet, and which, by the way, I, I do put on spreadsheets. And of course, you, you want the, the line the, the line graph that's pointing upwards. It's kind of like for those of you who are in sales or, or retail. You know, you've got quotas, and those quotas are based on previous numbers, only higher. And it's all very quantifiable. And that's how people like me think about church growth. But Paul doesn't seem interested in those kinds of numbers. What he's publicly thankful for, that the kind of church growth he's happy about, is that their faith is growing. And their love is increasing. Not giving and attendance, but faith and love. Faith just means trust, dependence. The, the, the hostility to the church and their city is growing. What was coming at them is growing. But, but so is their faith. In Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, when we read between the lines a bit, it, it seems that he had been worried that they might lose their faith. He was worried that, that the, the persecution and the pressure from hostile people would be so strong that they'd just take the path of least resistance and, and walk away from the faith. But now Paul's thankful that not only have they not lost their faith, but that their faith is growing. And so is their love. It, it seems that from First Thessalonians that the church at some point had written a letter to Paul and so these letters are kind of responses back to them. And they were asking him a bunch of questions about just what the heck they're doing. So remember, Paul was run out of town before he had a chance to establish them very deeply in Christian teaching. So this is a church without very deep biblical knowledge, without a very thorough grasp of, of doctrine. Um, they're noobs, as you gamers would say. They just don't know that much. And one of the things they were unclear about was love. Brotherly love. You know, what are the obligations that we have for each other in this church, they asked. So Paul had explained it in his first letter. It's just basic Christian love. And now, not only are they clear on that point, but they're increasing in it. It's a love of each person for each other person. That's growing. And by the way, this is a lot more than good vibes for each other. Uh, brotherly love in the Bible is, is active, it's sacrificial, it's forgiving, it's patient, it, it, it prioritizes the other person's interests above your own, it looks out for the, the vulnerable and the marginalized. In other words, it, love in the church is a mirror, a reflection of God's love for you in Jesus Christ. Jesus loved you, he died for you, so he could bless you. That, that, that's the kind of love going on in this church. People are dying for each other, in a sense. They're, they're serving each other, blessing each other. And it, it reminds me of what happened about a, a year ago, maybe 11 months ago, when our youngest son caught a bad case of croup, and which sent him to the, the ER and then three nights in Lurie's Children's Hospital. And especially on that first night, it was this intensely terrifying and traumatic and disruptive event that we were not prepared for. And so many people kind of swarmed to us to, to keep our, our heads above the water and taking care of the other kids and preaching for me and visiting us in the hospital. It, it was like that, that cliche movie scene where someone's hanging off the edge of a cliff and someone you know, reaches down and, and pulls them back up. You know, Sylvester Stallone, kind of his muscles bulging, he pulls them back up. And that's how it felt for us. We, 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 were, we were pulled back up. And I'm so thankful for that. That's the kind of love Paul's talking about. So they're growing in their faith. They're, they're increasing in their love. And Paul's thankful for it. He's publicly thankful for how they're growing. And the reason he's saying that he's thankful is because he wants to encourage them to keep growing in that. 
I, I thank God for what he's doing in you. So, so keep going. Keep going in, in your progress. Keep going in your growth. Personal growth is a, a big thing for us. We have, we have personal trainers, uh, professional coaches. Uh, that's when I'll know that I've, I've really made it professionally when I have a, a professional coach. Uh, there's an industry built around the idea that we want to be the best versions of ourselves that we can be. The Huffington Post had an, an article called 14 Ways to Simulate Personal Growth. You know, things like surrounding yourself with, with great people and getting rid of toxic people in your life, uh, decluttering, reading, it, not exactly rocket science kind of stuff. But, but it's really interesting how the, the article starts. Listen to, to what it says. You know you're here for big things, right? You have a difference to make and a purpose to live. And if you're doing that right now, perfect, keep doing your thing. If you're not and you're unsure how to start, it's possible you've missed the important journey you need to take to get to where you want to be. That's really intense. Yeah. The world needs me, so I better declutter my closet. I, I poke fun, but, but, but we're, we're, we're anxious about this, aren't we? We, we, we want to grow. We, we want to be better. We, we, don't, we don't want to get stuck. But Paul says, you want to know two things that are worth being thankful for in your growth. Your faith is growing. Your love is increasing. You're, you're trusting Christ. You're resting in your Father more securely and confidently than you used to, even though you're suffering at the same time. And, and you're loving other people in this, this weird, dysfunctional family called a church with more selflessness and thoughtfulness than you were before. Now, how do you do that? How do you grow like that? When you know who you are, when you know that your identity is more than what you do, but when you grasp that the most important thing about you is that you are a child of your father, and you know that you are a servant of your master who died for you. But when you know that, when your identity is more deeply rooted in God your Father and in Jesus your Lord, you can grow in faith. Because when I root who I am in him, and not in my work, or my culture, or my family, but in him, then the hard things are still going to come at me, but they're not going to undo me. They're going to challenge me, sure, but there are also going to be opportunities to grow in my faith because I'm trusting more deeply in the one who tells me who I am. And when I know that my identity is in my Father who loves me and in my Lord who died for me, I can grow in my love for other people because it's not something that I'm doing on my own. I'm doing it as a child imitating my Father. Knowing who I am in him helps me to grow. And remember, Paul's saying this to a church. It's not just your personal identity. It's, it's our identity as a body of people in this together. Every church has a vibe, the, the music style, the, the liturgy, the, the ministries, the people. Every church has its own you know, flavor, and that's fine. But, but what if more important than those things, more important than styles and numbers, was that we're growing in our faith and increasing in our love? That would be something to be thankful for. And it's something that comes when we're rooted in who we really are, which is who we are in God. So keep growing in your growth. Lastly, keep going in your endurance. You can keep going in your progress, your growth, because of who you are. And you can keep going in your endurance because of who you are. In verse 3, Paul was thankful. In verse 4, he is boastful. Look at that with me. It says, Therefore we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. Now remember, Paul had to leave this church in the middle of the night. So they're brand new Christians. They're facing unbelievable hostility, something unlike this church here I think we'll ever have to face as far as I can tell. And Paul had been worried about their faith. He wasn't sure if they were going to make it. But he's not worried anymore. He's thankful. And he's not just thankful. He's boastful. He's bragging about them. He's praising them to other churches. Uh, think about what, what this does. Imagine this scene in another of Paul's churches. 
He says, hey guys, I, I know you're struggling right now. I know it's hard following Jesus, but, but let me tell you about some of our brothers and sisters in the church in Thessalonica. They've got it so hard, but their faith is strong. That They're enduring and persevering, even though people want to wipe them off the map. Most boasting, you know, is really off-putting. But this is the kind that's that's inspiring, you know. When I'm struggling in my faith and, and I hear about your endurance in your faith when you're struggling, it encourages me to endure in my faith. And for the Thessalonians to, to hear about how their faith is an inspiration to other churches' faith, that encourages them to keep enduring in their faith. It's this, it's this cycle of encouragement, right? But think about what Paul's saying. All your persecutions... All your afflictions, everything hard that's coming at you right now, and you're steadfast in your faith. Think about your own afflictions at the moment. It probably doesn't look like what this church is going through. You're not, you're not facing mob violence for your faith. Uh, there are Christians in the world, some places in the world today, who do face mob violence uh, and government oppression and, and being disowned by their families. And we don't have that here, which I'm thankful for. But still, you struggle. You suffer. You're afflicted. Hard things come at you. And sometimes the way we process these, these, these things, these struggles, is by comparing it to other people's struggles. You know, you know compared to that person, I don't, I don't have it that bad at all, and it makes me feel really guilty about having such a hard time with it. Or what are they fussing about? If they could see my life, they, they, they get over themselves. Those, those thoughts go through our heads, and, and they don't really help us. Instead, think about it this way. One pastor called it your significant suffering. Maybe it's chronic pain. Maybe it's relational conflict. Maybe it's, it's professional disappointment. But whatever it is, it doesn't really matter how it compares with other, what other people are going through because it's hard, and it's significant to you. It's your significant suffering. So in your significant suffering, how's your faith doing? Are you like the Thessalonians, You're growing and persevering, or are you retreating? If you're persevering, if you're enduring, if, if you're growing, that's something to boast about with Paul. It's not, not, not the, you know, pat yourself on the back for how tough you are, not, not, the, not, not the drop little hints into the, every conversation so that people will be impressed with your strength, but it's, it's boasting in God's grace in your life. It's, it's gratitude for his presence and his mercy when maybe you have, you have nothing else really to be thankful for. In other words, this is hard, but God is sustaining me. And I praise him for sustaining me. He, he's, he's working in me. But if you're retreating, if you feel like your faith is losing this terrible battle, I've been there. A friend of mine told me the other day that he was this close to losing his faith. That's how much he was struggling. Now, God pulled him back. God answered his prayer for, in the area that he was struggling with. But, but he was this close that's how heavy it was. And if that's what you're going through, I want to remind you of who you are. You can suffer terribly, but you're a child of your father. You can be afflicted and worn down, but you are in Jesus. And Jesus is your Lord. Let me put it this way. Who you are is bigger than what's happening to you. Who you are in Christ is bigger and more permanent than what happens to you. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. It's, it's just a fact. You will have trouble. But take heart, he says, I have overcome the world. And Lauren Whitman, a counselor, reflects on these words. And here's what she says. This life, this world, our sufferings, our sorrows, and even our sin, they're all temporary. They're passing away. Jesus is greater. Jesus is mightier. He said he overcame this world, and he did. He went to the cross, from the cross to the grave, from the grave he was raised, and after that he ascended into heaven and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. He is no longer in this world. He has overcome it. And we are in him. His life trajectory has become yours. You will overcome too. You will overcome the woeful ways this world batters and bruises you. Not because you're good or capable or strong or even faithful, 
but because Jesus overcame the world for you. This is a solid rock of hope you can stand on when trouble assails you. They will not have the final say. They won't define you or your life. They won't overcome you because you have a God who overcame them. And Lauren Whitman mentions a woman she was meeting with, someone who was, who was struggling. And this woman, her, her, her significant struggle uh, might sound like yours. She was, she was a perfectionist and she had a demanding job. So an objectively difficult job and a personality that was never satisfied with your job performance. It was crushing her. That, 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 that was her struggle. And the way that she faced her struggle was with that same kind of perfectionist approach. You know, if, if, I, if I just study harder, if I just work longer hours, if, if I just outsmart this thing, then, I, then I'll beat it. I won't have to struggle anymore. So if I do the right thing, then I won't have trouble. But it didn't work. She still struggled. But then she learned who she was in Christ, that her identity is in her Lord who loved her and overcame this world of persecution and affliction. And and she learned that, that good cheer didn't come from outworking trouble, but in resting in Christ. And Whitman says that she began to know the freedom that though she can't be perfect and coast through life without trials, she has a God who nonetheless gives her reasons to be glad. You know the hard things you're facing, but do you know who you are? Do you know, church, that you are in Christ, that you are in your Father? Do you know that you are, that, that you are in him who gives you grace and peace at every moment that you are struck down? The more deeply you know that, the more tightly you grip that, when you're afflicted, when you suffer, because you're going to suffer, you, you, you can't work yourself out of it. But when that significant suffering comes, and you know who you are, you can be steadfast and faithful. There's something to boast about. So keep going in your endurance. Keep going in your growth. Keep going in your endurance. Keep going because of who you are. Who you are in your Father. Who you are in your Lord, your ruler who you are and the one who gives you grace and peace. My hero, David Pallison, says this about identity. He says, when it comes to your identity, you must always start with this understanding. Your identity is a gift of grace in Christ. It's a gift that, in our new birth, God creates a new identity for you as a child, a child of the living God, as someone who has been forgiven, as someone who has, been, who has awakened to the fear of the Lord and knows that God is great and that you are small. God is the one who evaluates us. We are not the ones who get, to say the last, who get the last say with regard to who we are. And on the last day, the day when we see Christ face to face, we will not only know God as he is, but we'll also know ourselves as we actually are. All of those partial senses of our true identity will come into their fullness. We will know that we are the beloved children of a loving father. We will know that we are servants. We will know that the hopes that we have placed in him have come true. Our identity and self-understanding will come to fruition. Because that's true, because you have that hope, you can keep growing now. You can keep persevering. You can keep going. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are not alone, but that you have made us in you. We are in our Father. We are in our Lord. We belong to him. We are united to him by faith. We pray that that identity, that union, which is existentially real, would be real in our hearts, that we would, that we would live as if that is true, that when we face hard things, struggles, afflictions, pain, sorrow, mistakes, disappointments, all this, when we face them, they wouldn't overwhelm us. They wouldn't bury us. They wouldn't destroy us. But we would grow. Our faith would grow. Our love would grow. That we would keep going and persevering and be thankful and boastful, not in ourselves, not in our strength, but what you're doing in our lives. You have made us in you. Lord, give us grace and peace, which is in you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.